Hello, my name's Bev and I'm the author of the book Please Eat, A Mother's Struggle to Free Her Teenage Son from Anorexia, which describes our family's battle with the deadly eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, which my teenage son Ben developed back in 2009 when he was just 15 years old. Welcome to Chapter 5, which is called Back to School. The new school year begins as usual. It's year 11, GCSE year, the final year before the sixth form. Ben seems much more subdued than last year. If I thought the hair preening and body checking were bad in the spring, things are ten times worse now. He seems to be having a bad image day almost every day. He's spending ages getting ready for school. Everything about his uniform is wrong. Blazer too big, sweater too shapeless, Shirts too unflattering, and almost immediately we have to buy new trousers as the old ones are far too big. We've been shopping and Ben has bought a girls' school sweater, tight and shaped at the waist, making him look even thinner. Boys' sweaters are too baggy. They make him look fat, he says. Every morning I catch him examining himself critically in the full-length mirror, carefully arranging his sweater shirt and tie and adjusting his hair, which he's already straightened with tongs and messed up with goo. Please let him be happy with the results, I whisper to myself, knowing that if one hair is out of place, Ben's mood will flip and he'll take it out on me. Why the heck did I ever suggest buying a bigger blazer so he could grow into it, rather than one that fitted? He's swamped in it now, and of course he's blaming me. Part of me says this is normal 15-year-old behaviour. I mean, show me a teenager that isn't rude to their parents, doesn't check their hair and clothes 100 times in the mirror and doesn't hate wearing a school uniform. But the other part of me says this isn't normal. What's happened to the boy whose birthday parties had to be held in shifts because he was so popular? The boy that sang in a band, watched movies and had fun. Ben is still not mixing with his friends. Mum, I feel so disconnected, he says. I just can't relate to them anymore and they're always annoying me. This conversation is repeated almost every evening like a stuck record. Someone always seems to have wound him up in some way and Ben always seems to be on a downer. He's even less enthusiastic about rugby. It's the first match of the season and the parents are gathered around the pitch hugging styrofoam cups of coffee. Some of the boys, including Ben's friend Kieran, have been picked to play for the second team with the sixth form boys. Ben has been picked too, but I'm worried he doesn't have enough bulk. Not to play alongside 18-year-olds built like brick outhouses. What is the coach thinking of? Ben's not keen either, and tries to get the coach to move him back to the less aggressive third team. The coach has high hopes for Ben and isn't pleased. Something in me wishes the coach would refuse to let him play altogether. Can't he see Ben is too thin for rugby? This season, Ben just doesn't seem to have the stamina he had in the days when he would drive down the pitch like a steamroller, flattening the opposition in his path before hurtling himself and the ball over the touchline to loud cheers. I can't help thinking that if someone tackled him roughly now, he'd snap like a twig. So, when he breaks his nose a week or so later and is invalided out of the team, it's not a great surprise. In fact, it's quite a relief. At the end of September, I fall sick. Suddenly and without warning, I lose my balance. I feel nauseous and dizzy, as if I'm walking on a ship in high seas. My brain feels like mush. I can't think straight and I certainly can't work. Before long, supermarket shopping becomes a nightmare too, as the shelves and aisles swim before my eyes. Ben takes over all the cooking and I spend the greater part of each day in bed. So in the event it's me that visits the GP first, 
but the GP can't find anything wrong and I feel like a fake. A day or so later, I'm back in his surgery, this time with Ben. Ben's lost an awful lot of weight recently, I explain, and he's been doing a lot of exercise over the summer. The GP looks across at Ben. Your mum seems to think you're not eating enough. What do you think? Ben shakes his head and sighs as if humouring me, then smiles and says calmly, I'm fine, I really don't know what my mum's worrying about. The GP looks over at me, eyebrows raised for my response. I could be imagining it, but I suspect there is a hint of the overprotective fussy mother in that look. Yes, again, I feel like a fraud. OK, Ben, let's see how much you weigh and I'll measure your height too. The GP walks over to the scales and asks Ben to remove his shoes. Ben's weight is low, but not overly so. Not enough to start the alarm bells ringing if you hadn't known him as a big burly rugby player. The GP turns to me for my response. I can't read his expression. A wave of self-doubt sweeps across me. Does he think I'm making it up? After all, he couldn't find anything wrong with me the other day. And now here I am with my son, who doesn't appear to have anything wrong with him either. We're sent away with instructions to eat sensibly and come back in a couple of weeks. I meekly take Ben home. A few days later, Ben falls sick with flu-like symptoms and lies in bed groaning with sudden bouts of sobbing. I call the surgery and talk to the nurse. He's not eating, he's lethargic and he's aching all over, I explain, telling her that it doesn't, he doesn't seem to have a temperature. Could it be the flu? The nurse thinks it's probably a virus, but she's not sure, so I take him into the surgery to get him checked over. No fever or vomiting, she writes in his notes, but he's lost his appetite and he's losing weight. I've been busy googling Ben's symptoms. Do you think he could be de developing an eating disorder? I ask, hoping and praying she'll put my mind at rest. She doesn't appear to be unduly concerned. Am I fussing over nothing? Is it just one of those mysterious 24-hour bugs that disappear as quickly as they came? Back home, Ben's moods are beginning to swing quite violently. One minute he's completely normal, and the next he's sobbing uncontrollably, claiming to be freezing cold, then hot and aching all over. Cramps in his stomach make it uncomfortable to eat. I notice the skin on his hands, especially between the fingers, is dry, scaly and red. I take one of his hands to have a closer look. It's ice cold. I make two more appointments with the GP, one for Ben and another for me because my nausea and dizziness are getting worse. The GP notes that Ben feels generally unwell but, like the nurse, he doesn't think it's a viral infection. I point out that Ben's still not eating properly. We've had to borrow my dad's leather punch to add extra notches to his belt and buy new school trousers. Again, I ask if Ben could be developing an eating disorder. The GP makes Ben promise to eat more and we're dispatched off home with some creams for his dry skin. It's all in your mind, a voice shouts inside my head. I'm here again, I say, feeling like a fraud as I walk into the GP surgery the next day but I manage to get him to refer me to a specialist who eventually diagnoses a problem with my inner ear. Then the following week it's Ben's turn. This time I book him in with a different GP. I, re I really can't face the other one again. But Ben's weight has gone up. Damn, part of me says as Ben gives me one of his accusing, see, I said you're being silly, her looks. That's put a spanner in the works. I feel as if I'm making a fuss over nothing. His mood is getting worse and so is his behaviour, I tell the GP, hoping this will trigger alarm bells. The GP nods, turns to look at Ben and gives him a short pep talk about sensible eating. 
Starving yourself can seriously damage your body, the parts you can't see, the internal organs and so on, she tells Ben, explaining that he mustn't cut back on food. At your age, you need to put on muscle, which means you need to eat sensibly. Then she adds, If you'd like to see me on your own, without your mum, and just talk about things, then I'll be more than happy to do that. How about in three or four weeks' time? Once you've had time to think through what I've been saying. I can sense Ben getting agitated. Suddenly and without warning, he stands up and shouts, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me. He glares at me. You're just paranoid. I don't know what I'm effing doing here and storms out of the surgery. I get that look again from the GP. I feel helpless. Ben is losing weight fast and behaving strangely. Normally he'd listen to the GP's advice. That's the sort of person Ben is, or the sort of person he used to be, with impeccable manners and respect for authority. But now he's in complete denial that there's anything wrong. I can't get my head round it. What happens if he continues to lose weight? More and more, I'm worrying that if left unchecked, whatever it is could develop into something serious like anorexia. I mean, anorexia has to begin somewhere, doesn't it? People don't just become skeletal overnight. They have to start losing weight first. Is this how anorexia begins? Is it possible to have anorexia or at least to be developing anorexia, yet not to appear much different from anyone else. But surely boys don't get anorexia, or at least I've never heard of a boy getting anorexia. Yet my gut instinct tells me this could be where Ben's heading if someone doesn't take action soon. My blood freezes at the idea. But Paul and I seem to be the only people that are worried. The GPs don't appear to be. Ben isn't worried either. He can't see anything wrong. He doesn't seem to realise how drastically his behaviour, mood and physical appearance have changed over the last few months. This isn't like a normal illness or a problem where recognisable symptoms are there for all to see. A broken bone, a worrying lump, blood loss or whatever. The sort of issues that GPs deal with on a daily basis. Here I am with a child who... If you haven't seen him as a stocky rugby player, looks relatively normal if rather thin. Apart from that, there are no visible symptoms. I mean, he doesn't look like a textbook anorexic. He's not skin and bone, he just looks skinny. Worse, he insists there is nothing wrong with him. How on earth can I expect the medical profession to take me seriously when even the patient insists they're okay and alleges their mother is imagining it all? Especially when that mother appears to have a curious, unidentifiable illness of her own. Am I imagining it? Is it all in my mind? Am I going crazy? I'm seriously beginning to wonder... That's the end of chapter five. If you want to go on to chapter six, which is called Six Pack, please click the in video link, which appears at the end of this video. I look forward to seeing you there. It would also be really good if you could like this video and you can subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button below. Oh, and don't forget to visit my blog you'll find the link below. You'll also find a link to my website where you can download PDFs of my blog for free.